Good morning and welcome to this online service coming from the parish of Wargrave with Knoll Hill. If you haven't met me before, my name is Hugh Barn and I'm one of the two curates here in the parish. Now I'm expecting that many people might have uh, tuned in eager to see what the Sunday Club have been up to after they were set that assignment by Camilla last week. Well, many families have sent in pictures and videos showing how they were working through that passage near the beginning of the Book of Acts. And we've now got a short presentation to show what they were up to. So Scarlett, what's Peter saying to the people? Uh, trust, wait. Yeah, trust in who? Trust in Jesus and sorry for your sins. So, good morning, Austin. Are you going to tell us what we learned about Peter today? What did he tell everybody? Stop running away from God and he'll fix you. Your sins. Well, a big thank you to everyone who sent in those photos and videos. It was lovely to see what you got up to as you study that passage in Acts. And hopefully next Sunday, there'll be more for us to see of how you've been working through the next bit of Acts, Acts chapter 3. Before Grace comes to set you some challenges in that passage, we're going to pray a short prayer that asks for God's help. God's help for us to engage with him. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord, direct our thoughts and teach us to pray. Lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Sunday Club members are looking at Acts, so if that's you, then hopefully you've had a pack of materials, craft ideas and worksheets dropped through your doors. Now, Acts is all about what Jesus' followers did in Jesus' name after Jesus had gone back to heaven. So Jesus died on the cross. He rose again, conquering death, saying no to death, and rising back to life. And then he went back up to heaven. And after Jesus went back up to heaven, which is where he is now, he sent down to earth, instead of him, his spirit. And the start of Acts sees Jesus' spirit coming to live in his followers. And from then on, Jesus' followers do Jesus' job here on earth by the power of his spirit. So Acts is all about the things that Jesus' followers did in Jesus' name on earth after Jesus had gone back to heaven. And Acts chapter 3, which is where Sunday Club are today, shows some of Jesus' followers doing and saying things that only Jesus could have done, only Jesus could have said, but they're doing it because they're his followers continuing his mission in his power by the Spirit on earth. So in those packs of materials, Sunday Club members get today to look at Acts chapter three, where Peter and John, two of Jesus's followers, do an amazing thing. They heal a man who could not walk. Now that is something that only Jesus could do. And they do it because they have Jesus' spirit in them. They have his power. They're doing his work on earth. It's a really exciting thing, and there's lots of opportunity for you to explore it and talk about it and think about it with your parents at home. So Sunday Club, we hope that you really enjoy looking at that and making the most of your opportunity to think about how Jesus continued his mission on earth through his followers. Um, before it's time to have a look at that. We've got a song 
which helps us to think about that a little bit, um, about those followers who did incredible things in Jesus' name. Um, and the song, the song at the beginning talks about um, a man who asked for an arm. Now, you'll see on the screens if you look really carefully that it's not an arm like these. It is an arm that means charity, money that this man might be given. So there is a poor man who cannot walk who is asking for money. So he's asking for money, arms, not arms, because he has these, but he doesn't have money. So we're going to sing about him and you'll learn a little bit about the story from the song and then you can go away and look at the story yourselves and explore it through your craft activities. Again, please do take some photos, some video. We'd love to see what you're getting up to at home and how you're learning these things as, um, as families and how that's all going. So do send those in and we would love to feature those next week so that the whole church family can see what the children are up to and feel involved. For now, let's sing, Silver and Gold Have I None. Each week we will be aware of ways in which we've failed to live up to our own standards, let alone to the standards that Jesus lived out by his own example and taught. So we come now to a time of prayer where we express sorrow for our sins and ask for God's forgiveness. As we did a fortnight ago, we will pause after the first two sentences of each paragraph to draw to our minds particular instances and then I will say Father forgive us and we'll all join in saying save us and help us. Let's pray. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you.
Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. Now we celebrated Ascension Day just a few days ago and we had a service to market on Thursday evening. And I think there are three things that give us great assurance as we come to God and ask for forgiveness of sins that are all linked to the ascension. They all start with a P, which will help us to remember them. First of all, there is a plea. The Bible says that Jesus is our advocate in heaven. In 1 John chapter 2, it says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Think of someone pleading on behalf of the accused, arguing for their innocence. He pleads on our behalf. And the evidence he gives is his own death on the cross. Jesus says, that is where I paid for their sins. He makes a plea on our behalf. Secondly, he makes a promise. A promise that where he has gone to be with the Father, we too, as his forgiven people, can follow. One of the disciples came to Jesus and asked Jesus to show him the way to the Father. Jesus replied with the famous words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. As if to say, you want to get to the Father, you get to the Father through me. As Jesus ascended to the Father and showed that it was possible for physical human beings to pass through death and beyond the grave to be with the Father, Jesus gave us a promise, a guarantee, that we can go where he has gone. And thirdly, Jesus going to the Father promises power to us. At the beginning of Acts, Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. So not only do we have him pleading for us on our behalf in heaven, him promising that we can go where he has gone, we also have him empowering us now by his spirit to live transformed lives, lives that display his righteousness. Let's now pray together this prayer of assurance. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song we will praise our God. We celebrate the plea, the promise, and the power that Jesus' followers can know because of his ascension in the words of this ascension hymn, Hail the day that sees him rise.
we now have a short video to watch produced by the Church of England, helping us to think about our giving in this time of lockdown. During this difficult time when our church buildings are closed, we're still a church, meeting virtually for prayer services and fellowship, loving our neighbours by offering practical support to the vulnerable and caring for our communities. The work of our church is reliant on people's generosity. If you're able to give more at this time, here's how you can help. We now have our first Bible reading from Psalm 34. If there's a Bible within reach, then I'd encourage you to press pause and grab the Bible and then follow along reading this wonderful psalm. The words may not be in the same translation as yours, but there's lots for us to cling to in this psalm. The Bible reading is taken from the 34th psalm, verses 8 to 22. Taste then and see that the Lord is good. Happy the man who finds refuge in him. Fear the Lord, all you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. Unbelievers suffer want and go hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Which of you delights in life, and desires a long life to enjoy all good things? Then keep your tongue from evil, and your lips from uttering lies. Turn from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cries. The Lord sets his face against evildoers to blot out their memory from the earth. When men cry for help, the Lord hears them and sets them free from all their troubles. The Lord is close to those whose courage is broken and he saves those whose spirit is crushed. The good man's misfortunes may be many, the Lord delivers them out of them all. He guards every bone of his body, and not one of them is broken. Their own misdeeds are death to the wicked, and those who hate the righteous are brought to ruin. The Lord ransoms the lives of his servants, and none who seek refuge in him are brought to ruin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Julia and Grace are now going to read this passage from 1 Peter chapter 3 that we're going to have preached to us. Again, I'd encourage you to look this up in your Bibles at home. Here's a little chart that helps us to find 1 Peter. There's no shame in having trouble finding some of these smaller books towards the end of the New Testament and making use of help like this uh, is exactly what we should be doing in order to follow along. The reading today is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 3, verse 8. Suffering for doing good. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. 
he must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolises baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. Good morning. My name is Tim and let me extend my warm welcome to you especially if you're watching from outside Wargrave. Let's pray as we come to God's word together. Loving Father, we thank you that you're a speaking God and you speak to us through your word. Please help us now to listen well and speak to us so that we may live changed lives as a result of what we listen to. In Jesus' name, Amen. How do you feel when you are in the minority. When more people disagree with you, openly or covertly, than agree with you. When you are swimming against the tide of popular opinion. A few decades ago, Christians from the UK were a respected majority. Now, they are an often disliked minority. The number of true Christians in this country is probably around 10%. British culture is becoming increasingly secular, worldly and hostile to Christianity. Followers of Jesus are getting slandered, discriminated against, losing their jobs because of their faith and their biblical standpoint. Persecution in this country is increasing. Peter in this letter is writing to elect exiles scattered across Asia, encouraging them to stand fast in God's grace and reminding them that the gospel is true. We find ourselves in a situation more similar to Peter's original readers than we might at first have thought. So, how do we live as a minority? Our passage actually begins with the word finally, but our first point today is that we should live a godly life because that's our calling. The passage begins with five adjectives in the Greek that should mark our lives within the church. Firstly, like-minded. It doesn't mean agreement on everything, but united in our faith, the essential doctrines and our purpose. It is both sad and a very unattractive witness to the watching world when they see Christians disunited and arguing. Secondly, sympathetic. Thirdly, literally in the Greek, having brotherly love. Jesus said in John 13:35. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. It's clearly important. Peter repeats this command in chapter 1 verse 22 and chapter 4 verse 8. As Christians, we live and serve together primarily as loving family members. Fourthly, compassionate, being tender-hearted and caring towards one another. And finally, humble. How are we doing in these areas? 
I'm sure, like me, you can see areas we can grow in as we interact with one another as a church family and with other Christian friends. How sad it is when we're sometimes proud, arrogant, uncaring or unloving towards our brothers and sisters in faith. But verse 9 is even more of a challenge. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. In recent years I've read many stories of Christians coming to faith from Muslim, Hindu or Buddhist backgrounds. I have Christian friends whose families and communities are hostile to their faith in Christ. You might have such friends too. And yet I'm always encouraged by the deep love and care these Christians have for their persecutors. They don't exact revenge. They don't repay the evil they receive with evil. They bless and pity their persecutors, knowing God has called his people to holy living. What an example for us to follow. But why? What is the motivation for turning the other cheek, blessing our enemies and giving up our rights? Peter tells us in verse 9, Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. We are called to holy living. And in doing so, God will bless us, a blessing we'll enjoy for eternity in the life to come. In verses 10 to 12, Peter expands on this call to godly living by quoting Psalm 34. We heard this read earlier. King David wrote this psalm of God's deliverance after being on the run from Saul and living among the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 21. He was a lone exile in an unknown land, persecuted and surrounded by God's enemies. But he ultimately found joy in the Lord and reasons to live a godly life. Peter clearly applies these principles to us today as believers. We are to keep our tongues from evil, verse 10, and turn from evil, verse 11. God's face, meaning his grace and favour, is against us if we don't do this, verse 12. God's promises, however, to hear the prayers of his people and will lead them to see good days, eternal life, if we do good and live righteously. What a great motivation! For us too. So we're to live godly lives because we're called to do so. How are you doing with these commands? Are you repaying evil with blessing? Are you remembering God's promise of blessing despite the cost? I know in my own life the times I slip up and sin are when I forget the promises of God and focus on my own rights, comforts and my own will to be done. Secondly today, and our main point, is we are to endure suffering because Jesus has saved us and is triumphant. Over the past couple of months, we've had some messages repeated to us on how to live during this pandemic. Stay at home, wash your hands, observe social distancing. Because the virus is a reality, these instructions have been issued so that we don't spread it. And these instructions have been repeated because it is a real and ongoing problem. In every chapter of this letter, Peter writes about suffering. It was clearly a reality for his readers, and their response was an important message for them to hear. The same is true for us today in 21st century Britain. As Christians, we're not to look for persecution and suffering, but nor should we shy away from it either when it comes. Peter's rhetorical question in verse 13 suggests that if we're eager, literally zealous, to do good, people often won't be against us. The good works that Christians do in workplaces, communities and countries which are hostile to the gospel often allow them to stay there and continue to make Christ known. Yet, like a magnet, our Christian life will not only attract but also repel non-believers. But amazingly, Peter reminds us in verse 14 that we are blessed now if we suffer for our faith. It certainly doesn't mean that God is displeased with us when we encounter trials, as many people sadly think. Peter then quotes Isaiah chapter 8 verse 12, 
a promise made to Israel regarding the coming Assyrian invasion, that we shouldn't fear what our enemies do, knowing that God is in control and far greater than those who cause us suffering, we too should not have fear of what people might do to us. Instead of fear, we are to revere Christ as Lord in our hearts. As we remember how holy Christ is and the precious salvation he's given us, we should, verse 15, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks for the reason for the hope that we have. Our holy lives should cause people to ask about our hope. Peter assumes so. And we should be ready and unashamed to explain it. Are you? But we should, verse 15, verse 16, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. Not being gentle in witnessing damages Christians' testimony and alienates people from hearing the gospel. Sadly, this occurs too frequently. I'm sure we can all think of examples of this. And the word translated respect in the NIV is actually in the, holy, in the Greek, phobos meaning fear, from which we get the word phobia. Peter has already told us not to fear our persecutors. Here it is a holy fear of God that Peter has in mind. We should fear witnessing in a way that would dishonour God and tarnish our reputations as Christians and tarnish the gospel message. We should also fear dishonouring Christ by watering down the gospel message and not speaking of him. Verse 17, however, reminds us that God is in control, for it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing evil, for doing good, than for doing evil. That it is sometimes God's will that Christians suffer reminds us that even in our suffering and persecution, God is in control and things are not outside of his sovereign hand. When bad things happen because we're doing good, we can rest assured that God is in control and his will will be done. So why endure such suffering? Why persevere in living such godly lives? I think Peter gives us five reasons at the end of our passage as he focuses on Christ and his achievement. First and foremost, we endure suffering because Christ has brought us to God. Verse 18 is a verse I was told at university to memorise. There are four S's that remind us of the wonder of Christ's sacrifice for us. Sacrificial, he suffered. Sufficient, once it was sufficient to not need repeating and to forgive our, all our sin for all eternity. Substitutionary, the righteous for the unrighteous. And satisfactory, to bring us to God. God is satisfied with that and he can accept us and does accept us as his beloved children. We've been brought to God with sins forgiven so that we can live as his thankful and obedient children. If you're listening to this and wouldn't call yourself a Christian, I'd encourage you to read one of the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and find out more about who he was and his death on the cross and resurrection. Secondly, we endure suffering because it's better than disobedience. While verse 18 may be familiar, verses 19 and 20 probably aren't. Martin Luther described it as a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament. I read in one book it has at least 314 different interpretations. Many believe it to be a message of triumph and victory that Christ heralds to the imprisoned spirits of verse 19 who may be the offspring of the sons of God, of Genesis 6, verses 1 to 4. He did this upon being made alive in the spirit after his crucifixion. The other main interpretation is that this is Jesus preaching to unbelievers through Noah while Noah was building the ark. Peter tells us in chapter 1, verse 11, that Christ's spirit preached through all the prophets. Either way, we're reminded of his greatness and the triumph of Christ, and it is better to endure suffering with him than to be like those who were disobedient. Thirdly, we endure suffering because God will save us. Peter here reminds us of Noah's family, 
It's a picture of God saving a righteous minority, a mere eight people, whilst his judgment fell on hostile unbelievers on the earth. Just as God saved Noah's family through the ark, we, like Peter's readers, are to take heart that God will save us and bring us safely to heaven through Jesus. This is despite being a minority and having hostile unbelievers around us who will fall under God's judgment. Fourthly, we endure because we are saved people pictured in baptism. A cursory reading of verse 21 may imply the act of baptism is what saves someone, which would contradict the Bible's teaching that we're saved by faith and not by works, including baptism. Peter is quick to clarify that it's not the removal of dirt from the body, as in the water ceremony itself, that saves. It is Jesus who saves us through our pledge of a clear conscience towards God, an appeal, as some translations put it, for the forgiveness of sins and a new heart. This is portrayed in baptism. As Hebrews 9.14 says, the blood of Christ will cleanse us, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. Peter reminds us, using the example of baptism, that we are saved people, united to Christ, dead to sin, and called to live and serve Christ in newness of life. And fifthly, we endure because Jesus Christ is triumphant. Verse 22 says, All angels, authorities and powers are in submission to him. Authorities and powers on earth may cause us Christians hardships. But Christ's triumphant rule encourages us and they will one day give account to Jesus and be subject to his rule. On Thursday, Christians celebrated Ascension Day. We know Jesus is now reigning in heaven and one day will vindicate all Christians now suffering on earth. Suffering is hard, but we have many reasons not to fear it, but to endure it. What a challenge to us all. So how are you doing? As we finish, we've seen that we're to live godly lives because of our calling as Christians, as well as to endure suffering because Jesus has saved us and triumphant. How are we doing with these commands, with these uh, promises of God? As your neighbours, friends, colleagues and maybe family are against your Christian beliefs, are you living a godly life? Is your personal holiness causing them to ask questions about what you believe? And are you ready to give an answer for the hope you have in a gentle and God-fearing way? And will you remember Jesus has saved you and endure suffering for Christ? These questions challenge me greatly as well. May we be people who live godly lives and endure suffering as faithful followers of Christ. Amen.
Let us still our hearts as we come before our Heavenly Father with our prayers and petitions, remembering that he is the great King over all the earth, enthroned in the heavens and yet close to the poor and broken-hearted. He delights to hear our prayers and, and responds as he thinks best. From Ascension Day to Pentecost, the Church is encouraging us to pray for five friends or neighbours that God's Kingdom might come in their lives, that they might know Jesus Christ as their Lord, Saviour and Friend. Let us also pray that God's Kingdom might come in our world, our nation, our community and our own lives. Please join in the refrain, Your will be done, when I pray, Your kingdom come. Heavenly Father, we pray for our world, the world which you have made in all its beauty and diversity, which now seems to be groaning under the effects of a pandemic. May your kingdom come in power. We thank you for the blessings to the environment of less travel and consequently less CO2 in the atmosphere. And we pray that we would not go back to damaging ways when the crisis is past. We pray for wisdom and support for governments of all nations, but especially of developing nations, which are not able to provide safety nets to their people because of lack of resources and fragile infrastructures. And we ask you, Lord, to protect those who are living in refugee camps, such as the half a million Rohingya people in Bangladesh. We bring before you Tear Fund and other aid organisations that they might be able to get food, financial aid and emotional support to people whose already precarious circumstances have become desperate. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Heavenly Father, we pray for our fellow believers who are persecuted because of their faith in you. Today we think particularly about our brothers and sisters in Iran. Lord God, be a refuge and strength to all from minority faith communities in that land who have received excessive sentences on unfounded charges for what many would consider normal church activities. Encourage them and deliver them, for they trust in your name. Command your angels concerning all their ways. Protect them from all harm and show them your salvation. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Closer to home, we pray for wisdom for Prime Minister Boris Johnson, the Cabinet and senior civil servants, as they decide how best to halt the spread of coronavirus in the UK, whilst also protecting jobs. Please guard all NHS workers, and care home staff and provide them with all that they need. May you grant them courage rather than fear as they care for infected people. We pray too that you would give success to the track and trace system and the development of an effective vaccine against the virus. We pray for schools and nurseries which are planning for a partial reopening in June, asking that solutions might be found 
as to how this can be achieved in as safe a manner as possible, which takes children's development into consideration. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Heavenly Father, give courage and wisdom to all church leaders, bishops and archbishops who are seeking to bring Christ's presence and hope in this difficult time. We pray for God's blessing on our own church, asking that our community will be strengthened despite the inability to gather. May we be the hands and feet of Jesus in whatever ways we can. At this difficult time, we bring before you the families and friends of those who have died, whose funerals have just taken place. Please comfort the loved ones of Joy Downey, Mac Akers, Lloyd Wade, Edna Ansel and Elizabeth Pierce. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Almighty God, your ascended Son has sent us into the world to preach the good news of your kingdom by our words and our lives. Inspire us with your Spirit and fill our hearts with the fire of your love that all who hear your word may be drawn to you. In a moment of quiet, we bring before you a spouse, child, parent, friend or neighbour and ask that your kingdom may come in their lives. You know their hopes and dreams their hurts and disappointments. Meet each of them in their need this day, according to your infinite wisdom, mercy and grace. And may they all come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord, Saviour and Friend. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And finally, let us pray for ourselves. Father, help us to live this day to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Now let us conclude with the words which Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, 
now and forever. Amen. Well, Angie made reference to Thy Kingdom Come. And these 11 days between Ascension and Pentecost are set aside by Christians around the world as a special time of prayer. Praying that phrase from the Lord's Prayer, Thy Kingdom Come. If you haven't yet got access to a prayer diary, do get in touch and we'll point you to where you can get one to print out at home. Or if you're having trouble, we can deliver one physically to you. It would be a great thing to set aside these days for prayer, particularly as we look around the world and see all of the needs. Thy kingdom come, Lord, teach us how to pray. A dismissal prayer for us to pray together as we go from here. God the Father, who has given to his Son the name above every name, we go from here confident that you will strengthen us to proclaim Christ Jesus as Lord. God the Son, who is our great High Priest, passed into the heavens, we go from here confident that you plead for us at the right hand of the Father. God the Holy Spirit, who pours out his abundant gifts upon the church, we go from here confident that you will make us faithful servants of Christ our King. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among us all and remain with us always. Amen. As we go into the rest of our day and the rest of our week, ready to live a godly life, to live out our calling, and ready to endure suffering that comes from being followers of Jesus. We have him 
as a friend and we can bring to him anything in prayer. Yeah.